Is it a coincidence that God commands the covenant of circumcision right after Abram oppresses his Egyptian servant? We need to ask why this story of circumcision comes right after a story of oppression. When you study the Bible, there are certain things you need to learn how to recognize. I'm about to share the key insights and revelations that God has shown me in Genesis 17 over the last 10 years of studying. Hopefully, this will help you learn how to read the Bible on a deeper level. Here we are in Genesis chapter 17. It says, when Abram was 99 years old, the last story ended with Abram being 86, has Ishmael, now he's 99, the Lord appears to Abram. But before we move forward, let's summarize briefly this chapter. God makes a covenant with Abram, and the sign for him and his descendants is the physical mark of circumcision. God promises a son through Sarah. Abram obeys God's command by circumcising all the males in his household. And now we find our way through Genesis 17. Abram's 99. God appears and says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. We should probably ask what it means to walk before God and be blameless. But I think God will explain that I may make my covenant between me and you. And may multiply you greatly. God has already made a covenant in chapter 15 with Abram, where God cut a covenant. But now Abram has to walk before God and be blameless in verse 1. And it seems as though that's required in order for God to make a covenant with him in verse 2. Or is that not the case? Also, it seems as though Abram's descendants multiplying depends on whether or not Abram will walk before God and be blameless. But let's let's hold on to those questions. Hopefully they'll be answered throughout this chapter. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, this is a very practical and quick way for Abram to walk before God and be blameless. Let me get on my face. My covenant is with you, Abram, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. So is God saying his covenant is officially between him and Abram? Or is he saying that there is a covenant in the midst of them on the table as an offer? And again, these questions I know frustrate people because people don't like asking questions they can't get an immediate answer to. But hopefully as we meditate on scripture, these things become clearer. Looking at verse 5, no longer shall your name be called Abram. God changes Abram's name. Your name shall be Abraham. For, here's why, I've made you the father of a multitude of nations. I have made you. When did that happen? Abram has not yet acquired the son of promise through Sarah, that being Isaac. So why is God speaking in the present tense about something that has not yet occurred? What you're going to see in verse 4 through 8 is God is listing out the terms and benefits of this covenant, right? And God wants Abram to know, firstly, it is God alone who does this. God gets the credit. God gives him a son. God produces. This doesn't happen by Abram's efforts or Sarah's scheming, God alone makes Abram these things by his grace. He gives him a new name to let him know this is a milestone in your life. This marks a new day for you, and it's going to set you on a new journey. It's, a, it's almost like a, a new beginning for Abram. And if God says it's so, reality will eventually match up with God's declarations. So he says, I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations. Kings shall come from you. He says that will happen, but right here he says, I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. In other words, it's as good as done, even though you don't yet see the realization of those promises. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. Here's what it means for God to be in covenant with Abram and his people, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God is claiming Abram's descendants as his own before they ever exist, before that re- reality is materialized. God is outlining how this will play out along with some guidelines and details. So this is part of Abram becoming the father of many nations, or Abraham now. It's that Abraham actually represents them in this covenant, that they're grafted into in that language, to use that language that we use in the new covenant, grafted into Jesus. 
they're kind of grafted with Abram into this covenant. And I will give to you land, offspring after you, I think I just read this, the land of your sojournings, Canaan, and everlasting possession. So God promises to give land, nations, royalty, offspring, and a future to Abram and his people. And part of God being their God and claiming them is that they get land. And I think this land is a huge part, huge part of the equation and promises that God has given to Abram. That land is, is a massive part of this whole ordeal. And he says that this is an everlasting possession. Not only is this covenant an everlasting one, like he says here in verse 7, but the possession of the land is an everlasting promise as well. In other words, the nature of the covenant is the same nature of the promises and benefits um, that come from that covenant, that being the land and descendants and a name and faith and all that stuff. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant. So this is what it means for Abraham to walk before God and be blameless, right? This is at least what it involves. You and your offspring after you throughout their generations, this is my covenant. Here's what it means to keep it, right? Which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Abram's response, Abraham's responsibility doesn't seem to be what holds the covenant together, but rather is the right and appropriate response to the covenant God has already made and the promises God has already given. In other words, this seems to be a sign of the covenant that already ex- exists and is in, 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 it's active, rather than this sign of circumcision being the basis of the covenant. Even though the benefits only, ap- so let's think about this, the benefits of the covenant only apply to those who take the sign of this covenant, which is physical circumcision of the flesh. But that sign is not what holds the covenant together. It's God who makes this. God upholds it. It's on the basis of his grace and character. But if you want to enjoy the benefits of Abram and his household being a part of this covenant, you have to take on the sign. So I have a question. Why does God institute this covenant of circumcision 13 years after Ishmael is born. Why is the story of Hagar's oppression immediately followed in the next chapter by God instituting circumcision? Is there a literary narrative link to these ideas? Because both these stories have to do with seed. Both these stories have to do with what produces seed and descendants. In verse 12, he says, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Why eight days? Any link to creation and the idea of new creation? Every male throughout your generations, that's key. Whether born in your house, bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be circumcised. If you couldn't see that. So, I wonder why this covenant sign, why does God only give a covenant sign for males? Why institute a gender exclusive sign? And God repeats the idea of he who is born in your house, he who is bought with your money, right? Two times. I think God is really making it clear. There is an inclusion of the Gentiles, of foreigners, of strangers in the covenant of God from the very beginning. There's an invitation Anyone can experience the benefits of this if they're in the household of Abraham, similar to being in Christ, to benefit from the covenant he made with the Father on our behalf. This is the image, I think, that's being portrayed in this. And then verse 13, the idea of those who are born and those who are bought. I think God repeats the inclusion of those who are bought along with those who are born uh, because it so strongly foreshadows the gospel message. It's the inclusion of the Gentiles. It's the redemption or purchase of God's people by the blood of Jesus. In Abram's flesh, his kids take on the sign of the covenant for themselves. Or it doesn't do them any good to rely on their father having the sign of the covenant. In other words, well, I'm in Abram's household. Yeah, but if you don't have the sign, then the covenant made with Abraham, the benefits aren't extended to you. Well, Abram's my physical father. All that... All throughout the scriptures, this argument is made. Just because you physically belong to Abraham doesn't mean you have the benefits of faith. 
that Abram had through faith. The sign itself, this, this sign of circumcision, is only an effectual sign because God commanded it and because Abram first had it himself. In other words, cutting off foreskin does nothing unless God sovereignly declares that it has significance and it actually accomplishes something or it's, it's useful in something. The second thing is that this only matters for Abram's descendants because Abram first took the sign himself as a representative of sorts, like Jesus taking on our humanity, going through death, breaking out in resurrection power, ascending to the right hand of the Father. Everything that he underwent, we are spiritually baptized into through faith. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. So either you cut off the skin or you're cut off from the covenant. Either way, some kind of cutting is going to happen. The sign of circumcision is a personal sign of inclusion into the Abrahamic covenant. To be cut off from the covenant is to have never truly belonged in the first place. And one thing we have to ask is, was this sign of circumcision? This goes back to the question of why does this story immediately follow the oppression of Hagar in the last chapter? And I think here's a follow-up question we should ask. Was this sign of circumcision the result of Abram's sin, where they oppressed Hagar and mistreated her? Or was this always God's original plan from the beginning, regardless of Abram's own moral failure? That's something we have to ask, because there seems to be at least a connection between um, the reproductive organ being cut and Abram um, oppressing Hagar, the, the servant, in that manner, and almost making her produce their offspring. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. So part of God giving this covenant of circumcision involves him changing Abraham and Sarah's name. But why? What's the connection? Do they receive new names because this is a new covenant God is making? It's a new way of life. It's a new journey. Or is there something else happening? I think verse 16 will clarify. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. It's interesting that God does not give old Abram a son. He gives Abraham a son. And he doesn't give Sarai a son. He gives Sarah a son, almost like it's an image of this new identity, this new name being a prerequisite and a requirement for the blessings God wants to bestow on them. He says, I'll bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Jason and I have some free gifts for you on our website at abovereproachministry.com. Maybe you want to learn how to study the Bible. We have free Bible classes just for you. Are you maybe a newer believer? Go ahead and check out our Christianity 101 Foundations course. Maybe you hate videos. Well, we have a podcast, so you can listen to all of our messages on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Maybe you want to join or start a discussion group. Check out our map of all the current armed discussion groups all around the world. And do you maybe live near Greenville, South Carolina? If you do, you should check out our church on Friday nights. Visit movementchurchsc.com for more information. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, or head over to the donate page and donate through debit or credit card, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, or even mail a check to P.O. Box 509 Inman, South Carolina. And if you want to make a ministry connection, feel free to reach out to me on our website. All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm done. So let's get back to the video, right? So God blessing Sarah in this context is giving her favor to produce children and multiply. Like we see in Genesis 1, God enables Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. That's the blessing. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. We're going to see Sarah laugh also in a few chapters. And said to himself, which seems to imply a kind of doubt or disbelief. Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Here's my question. All throughout the last few chapters, Abraham's getting promises and glimpses into his future and details about his descendants. This whole time, has Abraham been thinking that Ishmael was going to be the vehicle for those things? Because Abraham's response seems to indicate that this entire time he thought it was about Ishmael. 
Was the sign of circumcision... Actually, I'm going to hold that question. Shall Sarah, who is 90, bear a child? So, obviously, this is not something Abraham has really been considering as a realistic possibility. But back to circumcision. Was the sign of circumcision part of the way God would give Abraham a child? Or is circumcision its own separate idea? Or is circumcision part of how God gives Abraham a child? Or is God merely telling Abram, hey, once you have a son, here's how you mark him as part of the covenant. Here's instruction. And it seems similar to how God, before he gives Israel the promised land, he tells them how to conduct themselves in the land, right? Here's what it looks like to engage in this covenant. It's interesting that this covenant sign God commands has to do with the reproductive organ of Abraham. And now Sarah is fruitful? That's That seems like a backwards thing to me. Kind of like how Elijah on Mount Carmel is asking for fire to come down, but he tells servants to pour water on the sacrifice first, which I think has its bearings in the Torah. There's reason for that, but it's almost like, let's, let's, stack, let's stack the odds against God so it's more impressive. And I wonder if there's a similar thing happening here, because you'd think that cutting the reproductive organ, the foreskin, would bring harm on Abraham's ability to produce a child. Right? Probably primitive science didn't yet know what we know. So from their vantage point, this would seem counterintuitive. And yet God brings fruitfulness in life through what appears to be the counter opposite of what would bring life. Which I think is gospel has gospel all over it. Sounds like the death of Jesus, him being cut off from the land of the living, being the means by which God gives us life through him undergoing death and resurrection and looking like he's failed, he offers eternal life through that mechanism and through that sacrifice. It seems backwards, right? But we serve a God who does things that look ba- looks backwards and produces the opposite. In verse 18, Abraham said, Oh, let Ishmael live before you. Abraham's still stuck on Ishmael, who is representing their human effort and what man can produce. And God does not want that. So you're getting a flavor for how Abram has really been thinking this whole time about all the promises and what God would do. And he's like, it seems as though this whole time Abraham has thought Ishmael was, was the guy. And Abram said to God, let Ishmael live before you. God said, no. No. You ever get that stern no? That's what Abram's getting. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. Remember how it says that Sarah gives Hagar as a wife in the last chapter to Abram? Well, God wants Abram to know, Hagar ain't your wife. Sarah's your wife. She will bear you a son. That's always been the plan. And you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. So the covenant God is making with Abraham is continued through who? Ishmael? No, through Isaac. The covenant God specifies extending to Isaac does not seem to be extended to Ishmael. Even though Ishmael will take on the sign of physical circumcision, he's not part of this blessing of fruitfulness and multiplication that ultimately brings about the Messiah and blessing to the Gentiles. God has promised Sarah and Isaac that dimension of the promise or that dimension of the covenant. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. This is the first time we see no, this is not the first time. We've already seen God, uh, Abraham, pray for Abimelech. But this is another time we see Abram ask and God regards his prayer. We'll see the same thing with Lot, where Abram intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah. I've heard you. I've blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. And what's funny is God already promised Hagar that before Abram ever desired this. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation too. Right? But I will establish my covenant with Isaac. That's what he's going to say. So there's obviously a huge difference between Ishmael and Isaac in the manner of how God relates to them in this covenant context. Isaac will be promised offspring, whom God will make fruitful and bless the nations and bring about the Messiah. Ishmael is not offered that. Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year that son Isaac. When he finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Pause. How did God go up from Abraham? And when we think about what Abram has been seen doing, he's been falling on his face. 
So we have God going up, Abraham bowing down. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. Like Abram did not sit on this for weeks, contemplating, is that really God? This would have been such an incredible demonstration of faith in God's word. Like this must have seemed so ridiculous to the outsider or to people in his household, to even his own wife, who doesn't even believe she can have a son. For Abram to return with news, God wants us to cut the foreskin of every male in our household. That must have sounded ludicrous. They must have thought Abram lost his mind. How hard would that have been practically to accomplish? How odd would that have sounded? How much convincing would there have been? Uh, Abram being the master of the house, probably not much. Just do it. But either way, how convinced was Abram? Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Over and over, the emphasis throughout this story is Abraham cutting off the flesh, which is the language that will be used throughout the New Testament. And God will tell his people, Israel, circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. So we know there's a foreshadowing. Ishmael, his son, was 13 when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. We're told how old Abraham is. I'm not sure exactly why. Is his age supposed to matter for what's happening? It says Abram was circumcised. So is, is it like even more jarring to know how old Abraham is as he's being circumcised? Is, that, is, is Abraham's age also supposed to make conception sound way less realistic? Like, is, that, is this detail supposed to symbolize man's barrenness until, until God makes them fruitful? Like, like, think about Abram's age. Think about Abram, what Abram's doing to his own reproductive organ. Think about all these. It's like God is stacking the odds against himself to make this miracle more impressive. God makes Abram and Sarah fruitful. After Abram wounds his own reproductive organ, after they've reached the age where conception is just impossible, then God chooses to intervene and bring a son. It's interesting. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. Abraham wasted no time obeying God. He obeyed this wildly outrageous command immediately. And all the men of his house, those born in the house, those bought with money, which I think that's the, those are the two categories we're working with throughout these last few chapters, is you have Ishmael and you have Isaac. You have Sarah and you have Hagar. You have those who belong in the house and those who were bought with money, the Egyptian servant Hagar, which I think is supposed to show this all-inclusive nature of God's kingdom and the covenants God makes and, and the love God has for all people, not just for the descendants of Abraham, so this means it wasn't just for the young men, the foreigner, those who were circumcised, every man in Abraham's house. We know he has enough men to have a small army to take down a few kings. And I wonder what was going through Abraham's head as he stepped out in faith and did this. Obviously, Gentiles are in Abraham's house, and they have a share in this covenant by taking on the sign of the covenant. What's interesting is how much this story emphasizes the foreigner or the stranger bought with money. Considering how we just saw Abraham and Sarah mistreat a foreigner in their household, Hagar, whom they bought with their own money, and they oppressed her, and she's a victim, and God defends her and cares for her and sees her affliction, this covenant seems to be an even clearer image and a bigger statement that God defends the foreigner. God loves the stranger. And God invites all people to benefit from the covenant he's made with his chosen partner. It's not just for one race, one ethnicity. It's not just for one group of people or one generation. It's for all people. And Abraham and Sarah have somehow become so narrow-minded and so selfish and so focused on themselves that they view people that they've bought with money and servants in their house and foreigners, they view those people as like means to an end. When God is saying no, this is not how we treat people. And I, th I think, I'm convinced, 
that the covenant of circumcision is actually part of the consequence for Abraham and Sarah mistreating Hagar and essentially forcing her to have, I don't care how culturally normal it was for the patriarch to to operate in that way and for the household to function in that way. In God's eyes, it seems the narrative wants to make it clear that was not right. This was not what God wanted. Not only was it the wrong way, it was the wrong thing and the wrong way to treat people. And so this seems to be God bringing the just consequences upon Abram. Now, other people might disagree and say, oh, no, I think circumcision and that physical sign of the flesh was always God's plan. That's fine. But I look at the chronology of these events and what transpires and what these events lead towards, and I go, hmm, I'm just saying, something to think about there. So that is our study on Genesis 17. I will not digress anymore. I'll see you guys in the next Bible study walkthrough where we will go through Genesis chapter 18. Hey, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more biblical content just like this. We have hundreds of videos, but you might be most interested in these ones right here. Also, visit our website for all of our free resources and classes. And thank you so much for partnering with us financially to make this ministry even possible. Keep moving towards Jesus, and I'll see you in the next video.